Hello, and welcome to the video series I'm putting together called Oh That Mo. This is Oh That Mo Part 1, and uh, if the quality doesn't look very good, I'm going to provide a link so you can see the original that I'm copying off of the computer screen. And um, uh, it's pretty long. It's about three hours and it's over three hours long. So this is a long series and I'm breaking this thing up into like 10 minutes each. So, oh, that Mo is uh, taint short, taint short. That's all I can say. So anyway, uh, if you can't see the Islamic sources, that's the Hadith, and um, the Clear Signs Quran uh, verses, then click on the link that will be put in the description and it will take you to the original and you can see it for yourself. Okay, here it goes. Gonna you know, turn this thing up here for you. Yeah. Muhammad, the founder of the Islamic religion, came on the scene about 600 years after Jesus and his apostles. He claimed he was the final prophet of the Abrahamic God, and that much of what the Jews and the Christians believed was wrong. He denied the Christian teaching of Jesus being God's divine son, thereby relegating Jesus to the status of a mere man, a mere prophet. Doing this, he also implicitly denied the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. He also denied Jesus' sacrificial death and resurrection for sins. Instead, he put his followers under a set of Islamic laws, which he claimed led to salvation, if followed. Such ideas resulted in his followers, the Muslims, claiming that the Jewish and Christian scriptures had been corrupted. In this documentary, we will examine whether Muhammad's views are true, and if he was a true prophet of God, as Muslims believe. We will also discern if his book, the Quran, is from God. To do this, we will be scrutinizing the earliest Islamic sources on Muhammad's life and teaching. We will be studying the Quran, the Hadith or Sunnah literature containing the sayings and deeds of Muhammad, the early biographies or Sirah literature of Muhammad, and histories of Islam, as well as Islamic scholars and commentators. We will historically consider if Muhammad was correct in his denial of Jesus' deity, death for sins, and resurrection by approaching the ancient Christian sources using the criteria of authenticity historians use to discern historical truth. Was Muhammad the final messenger of God sent to correct, corrupted, and false teaching? Or was Muhammad a false prophet sent by Satan to mislead people away from the truth of salvation and Jesus Christ? Join us as we consider these crucial questions exegetically, historically, and rationally. When discerning if Muhammad was a true prophet, it is important to consider his character. According to Muslims in the Quran, Muhammad is a beautiful pattern of conduct and an exalted standard of character. In fact, Muslims claim Muhammad was the final prophet of God for all mankind in all time. In light of this, when we examine the early Muslim sources, we should expect to find a Muhammad who is a moral ambassador of God. However, we actually discover countless abominable immoralities and examples of utter, unnecessary ruthlessness 
in Muhammad's life. Muhammad is a man who married more women than his own revelations allowed. He married the wife of his own adopted son. After Muhammad lusted after his adopted son's wife because of seeing her scantily dressed, his adopted son then divorced her and Muhammad shortly thereafter married her, claiming this was ordained by God. Surah 3337 of the Quran mentions this episode thus showing Muhammad believed his God supported this immorality, quote, Then when Zayd had dissolved his marriage with her, with the necessary formality, we joined her in marriage to thee, unquote. What a convenient revelation to suit Muhammad's desires. This is adultery according to the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 5.32 says, Everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery." Unquote. But Muhammad, if he is a man for today, let me ask you, why is it he married a girl who was only six and then consummated when she was nine and he was 53 years old? What did he do to the Jews in Medina? Look at what he did. He didn't even come from Medina. He came from Mecca. He moved to Medina in 622. By 624, he started confronting the Jews that were living there. And he threw out the Banu Kainu, the family, in the first year, uh, 624. A year later, in 625, he threw out the Banu Nadir family. In 627, he took all 800 men of the Banu Kodaisa family, gave them spades, had them dig their own trenches, and then slit their throats and let them fall into the trenches. 800 men in one afternoon. Is this a man that's... A model for today? Do you really want to follow a man like that? See, I'd rather come back to Jesus Christ. You want a man who is for today, come back to Jesus. He never let us, he didn't let anybody use, he never used violence himself. And even when violence was done against him, the one time that the disciples came to his defense, as he was being arrested there in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter comes up and cuts off the ear of the servant that's arresting him. What does Jesus do? He takes the ear, puts it back on the servant, turns toward Peter, and says, Put away your sword, for he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. Matthew 26, verse 52. Ooh, I love my Jesus. In the law of God, we're told that people are to love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and that we're also to love our neighbor as ourselves. This, Jesus said, for example, is the first and second greatest commandment of the law. Muhammad can be seen to have fundamentally violated this in any number of ways. Uh, we even see in the Islamic literature that Muhammad is uh, granted such an authority that he can even make the boast that he stipulated the terms or conditions of a covenant with Allah and that Allah was not to transgress this. This is a fundamental violation of everything uh, biblical insofar as God is always the one who makes covenants and imposes them on people. People don't have the right to uh, stipulate the terms of a covenant and impose them on God and say that he has to follow them or else. And yet, uh, just to give an example of this in the Hadith literature, we're told in numerous Hadith that Muhammad would act often lose his temper, and in the course of this he would end up cursing or even beating someone. And one particular case, we're told uh, Muhammad saw a slave girl, an orphan girl, and he cursed her. When her caregiver found out about this, she came to Muhammad and asked him what this was all about, and Muhammad smiled at her. And then he, he said this, he says, Do you not know that I made a covenant or a condition, a term with Allah, that whoever I curse, you know, if they don't deserve it, then Allah is supposed to make it a source of blessing for that person. So you see what's going on here. It's it's not simply that Muhammad is saying, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be okay. If this person didn't deserve it, that's all right, because Allah is going to bless that person. What actually is going on here is in the course of covering his tracks for why he would do this sort of pernicious evil, Muhammad actually tells us that he made a covenant. He stipulated conditions or a term that Allah was not to transgress. This is the height of arrogance, and it's an arrogance not simply in vaunting oneself over and against somebody that uh, has greater authority than you, but in this case, the God of the universe, the God who made heaven and earth, Muhammad and all creatures, and yet here's one of his creatures pretending to be in a position to uh, dictate things to God.
This same story also illustrates the immorality of Muhammad on the horizontal level. The very fact that Muhammad had to bring in this explanation of Allah blessing those Muhammad wrongly curses shows that Muhammad was immoral. He was given to uh, annoyance and fits of rage and outbursts, intemperate outbursts, uh, even against uh, poor orphan girls. Muhammad claimed the angel Gabriel gave him extreme sexual power and that people in heaven will have even more. In Ibn Sa'd's early 9th century biography of Muhammad, we read, quote, The Apostle of Allah said, Gabriel brought a kettle from which I ate, and I was given the power of sexual intercourse equal to forty men. Also, quote, The Apostle of Allah was given the power equal to that of forty men, and the people of paradise will be given the power equal to eighty men, unquote. Things like this show Islam is the product of a depraved 7th century desert man, as opposed to a holy god. He had sex with his slave girls. He supported idolatrous pagan practices like kissing the black stone and bowing down to the Kaaba. Um, he assassinated people for criticizing his religion. He executed people for making fun of him. He told his followers that women are stupid and that their testimony is unreliable. He tortured people for money. He supported his religion by robbing people. He preached a message of violence and cruelty, and he taught his followers to believe in a God who loves only them and no one else. This is the ideal pattern of conduct, according to chapter 33, verse 21 of the Quran. According to Quran 434, Muhammad allowed Muslim men to beat their wives, quote, but those wives from whom you fear arrogance, first advise them, then if they persist, forsake them in bed, and finally strike them. However, Muslim apologist Mustafa Zaid claims the original Arabic word merely means beat them lightly. This is false. The original Arabic word is wajra bahuna, and according to John Penrose, its primary meaning is simply, quote, to beat, strike, unquote. End of part one. Moreover, the following part two. Now remember, go to the link so you can see the good part. The, the good version.